Maybe we'll move to our next topic. Um, Dr. Martin will be talking about maintenance therapy. Um, so we've kind of been talking about it all morning, which is nice. And maintenance therapy, or, or we all uh, describe it as continuous therapy. So in, in myeloma, a lot of the drugs we have do a couple things. One, they do um, kill off some of the myeloma cells, but they also kind of put a blanket over some of the myeloma cells or increase the activity of the immune system to kind of cause a, gla- a global control of myeloma cell growth. And that's kind of how this concept of continuous therapy um, has evolved. Um, you know, the, I, I think there's really, and you've heard it today, there's two paradigms. Um, there's transplant eligible treatment and transplant ineligible treatment. And when I see somebody that's transplant eligible, typically I'm giving them four, cycle, four to six cycles of therapy. They're then getting their stem cell transplant, and then we'll talk about maintenance. If somebody is transplant ineligible, typically I'm giving them therapy for a little bit longer, eight to 12 cycles. And then we'll discuss continuous or or maintenance-based therapy at that time. Now, not everybody needs continuous or maintenance therapy, but I'll show you some of the data. And again, um, this is a personalized approach in myeloma, and it has to do with side effects. It has to do with your um, commitment to, to how close you are to the treatment center, how you can get laboratory tests done, et cetera. And it's a decision that you make together with your doc. Um, now, so the, the, again, part of the hypothesis is that, you know, if you're on this continuous therapy, you're going to stay in remission. We're going to drive that myeloma down, and it's going to stay in remission longer. And it's going to lo- uh, cause a prolonged remission. And then maybe if we even, even at low doses, with the, with the immune system active, maybe it can continue to chip away at that iceberg that uh, Dr. Chari or Ajay cho- uh, showed you earlier. And then obviously, we would love to improve survival at every step of the, every step of the way. Um, now, there's been plenty of trials. We've done a number of phase three trials where patients have um, received maintenance therapy or sugar pill. And that's after a transplant or just after regular induction therapy. And for the majority of those studies, the benefit has been with progression-free survival, that patients have been in remission longer. Not necessarily that they've survived longer, but they've been in remission longer. So if we can knock it down, put people on continuous therapy, and keep them in, th- in remission for a longer period of time, then we don't have to pull out the triplets or the quadruplets or the next, you know, next line of therapy. That, I think that is an advantage. Even though people may be on a longer uh, duration of therapy, they're on a lower dose of medicine, and it potentially is less toxic. So I want to show you a couple slides and in, in, in walk you through this on continuous therapy. And this is continuous therapy in patients that did not have a stem cell transplant. These data right here, the blue line is a group of patients that were taking Revlimid and dexamethasone (coughs) continuously from their initial diagnosis in myeloma. The two other lines, the yellow line and the red line, one, one of the groups, the red line, took Revlimid and dexamethasone just for 18 months, and then they came off their therapy, and they just followed them off therapy. And in the yellow, the yellow line, the patients took melphalan, prednisone, and thalidomide, okay? And it was to look and see which, which combination is better. As you can see, right at about 18 months in this curve, right about here, when patients in these two arms stop taking their medicine, all of a sudden, there's more people that relapse. And in fact, it looks like there is this kind of suppressive blanket from the, in my mind, the image, either the thalidomide or revlimid, that kind of keeps the immune system going, keeps things in check. And yeah, over here, there's some people that can, you know, the relapse happens, but it certainly happens less frequently if you're taking continuous-based therapy. This is a similar study that was done in Europe uh, where, this, where this yellow line, patients were taking revlimid as a maintenance. And these other two groups... Both of them were taking sugar pill as maintenance. 
And in these groups, the pill started at about 10 months. And you could see right after 10 months, lo and behold, if you take the Revlimid off, in fact, people start to relapse more frequently. So yes, imids probably do keep this suppressive coat. Now, if I actually also showed you a survival curve, like how, how is the survival in this, actually the survival curves of all th three of these arms overlap. And it's the same, because once it comes back, you can easily get, them, get a lot of these patients back into remission, okay? But again, we needed probably a doublet or a triplet to get them back in remission, where maybe if they just took that single drug, they would have been in remission longer and potentially had less, less side effects. Now, in terms, of, in terms of transplant, we've done a bunch of transplant studies. These are three large randomized studies. Each one of these studies showed an advantage to taking Revlimid as a maintenance, mostly in progression-free survival. And when we put all those uh, studies together in what's called a meta-analysis, in fact, what happened is there was a benefit for both remission duration as well as overall survival. And so there was an overall survival advantage of taking Revlimid as a maintenance versus not taking Revlimid as a maintenance. So because of that, especially post-transplant, I think most of us have selected Revlimid as our maintenance post-transplant. If you don't get a transplant and you're transplant eligible, we typically do Revlimid as a maintenance therapy, or um, Ajay's talked a lot about high risk. If it's high risk, sometimes we'll use proteasome inhibitors because proteasome inhibitors probably have a better effect in the, the truly high risk, the P53 or the 17P deleted patients. Now, one of the questions we don't know is how long, we've talked about it a little bit, is how long to give maintenance for. We still don't know. Is it one year? Is it two years? Is it three years? Some of these studies, people were on Revlimid forever. We've recently looked at all these data at UCSF in the couple hundred of patients that we've transplanted in the last five years and said, okay, how long are people taking Revlimid? And our general plan is to, for people to take Revlimid forever or until progression. But when our pharmacists look at it and said, okay, we went back to all your patients, in fact, what happened, and this is not only at UCSF, but it's been shown in other studies, that on average, people take it about 20 to 24 months. And people come off after that period of time because of side effects. You know, at, at, at the end of, you know, end of a year and a half, two years, people get tired. Sometimes people have GI side effects. Sometimes the bone marrow gets tired and the blood counts are low. And at, at that point in time, I do think it's fine to take uh, a holiday. Those data that I showed you with the survival advantage, most of those people came off the drug at two years uh, of their therapy. So that's all, that's all okay. Um, okay, so in terms of what drugs to use, I, like I said, most of the people are, are on Revlimid as a maintenance therapy. Sometimes we use Velcade-based therapy. And, and Velcade is given by a shot. But now we have oral and Ninlaro. And, and, Dr. Cho showed you a number of studies that are ongoing, and we're participating in an MMRF, MMRC trial with um, Washington University looking at Ninlaro as a potential maintenance therapy. Patients get four cycles of RVD and then get randomized to either Revlimid and Ninlaro as maintenance. So we'll see. We'll see what, what shows on those studies. This is how we kind of advance, advance the field. I think we've talked about all this in terms of Revlimid-based uh, uh, maintenance. So in summary, we have a bunch of studies, phase three studies, that shows um, mostly progression-free survival advantages, but we do have a meta-analysis that I think shows an overall survival advantage to post-transplant ma maintenance with Revlimid. Again, the duration is unclear, um, and we don't know, you know, it, one of the personalized uh, therapy things, we don't know if in every individual patient, you know, is it going to be beneficial for you? That's the discussion between you and your doc. It has to do with side effects, convenience, and um, you know, can you get back and forth for blood tests and to get the medicine? Um, and maintenance therapy, I tell all my patients, it's maintenance. It's meant to be like taking a vitamin, maybe a vitamin with a little side effects from the vitamin, but it's most, the side effects should be few and far between so that you can have quality of life. Right, at the end of the day, it's really about quality of life and quantity of life. Thank you very much. So there's, there's a question about the details of Revlimid. So dose and schedule. What do you use for Revlimid maintenance? Yeah, so for, um, for patients that have normal renal function, 
I typically start everybody up on, on um, 10 milligrams. Uh, there is a debate uh, ensuing on whether you do it for three weeks on and one week off or whether you just do continuous. I've probably um, changed it more to doing three weeks on and one week off rather than continuous myself. That again, six hematologists, 10 answers on that one. Um, but if people tolerate the 10 milligrams okay, after a month or two, I may go up to 15. Um, but most of my patients are on 10 milligrams. If there is any level of renal insufficiency, then I'll do five milligrams three times a week or five milligrams three weeks on one week off. And maybe for Erica too, um, the, there was a question earlier from your talk as well about what are the what's what medication was that that can help with the GI side effects with Revlimid? Oh, well called. So it's a bile acid sequestrant, and we typically give it uh, twice a day with meals. And what there's a what about the quality of life of patients? What do we think is on on Revlimid maintenance? Well, it's highly variable. I think. A large swath of patients have very few side effects with uh, 10 milligram daily dosing. Um, but if you had side effects when you were getting your induction chemo, it's fairly likely that you'll have some form of some version of those side effects on the maintenance therapy as well. So, you know, we have to take these uh, into consideration. Uh, as Tom said, you know, it's, maintenance therapy is meant to maximize quality of life and not just duration and. Uh, uh, if you're getting a lot of side effects from the maintenance therapy, then it's a discussion you need to have with your doctor. And, you know, Erica, we've had a lot of clinical trials where maintenance therapy was part of it, um, not just for infant, but there's other, other types. And what's your impression in terms of quality of life? I think for the most part, um, the quality of life is pretty good. There are some patients that... There are some patients that do require some additional medication to help control some of the symptoms, but for the most part, it's pretty tolerable. So I think uh, in our remaining minutes, um, there's some other questions that have come up not pertinent to these three <coughs> topics that I'll just ask our panelists to discuss. So first is uh, regarding the initial imaging. Um, somebody just had a plain x-ray and they wanted to know should they have anything else done besides x an x-ray at the time of initial diagnosis? So uh, the, the general consensus of the field is that you, you want to do a sensitive testing to look for bone lesions on the initial assessment. And so part of the question is what, what was found on that initial x-ray. If, if the bone lesions were identified on that initial skeletal survey, then they've been detected, and that's part of the staging workup. But I think the, the field is starting to migrate more towards uh, more sensitive imaging studies, particularly MRI and PET scans. And at least in our practice, we're routinely doing that. Um, we're having a lot of fights with insurance about it, but it is the, there's very good data now indicating that uh, these, these tests are more sensitive and pick up bone lesions that the traditional uh, skeletal survey don't find. So. And so a follow-up question on that is, uh, how often should these be done in somebody who is in remission? Uh, we do imaging studies once a year in patients who are in remission. And another interesting, uh, maybe this is a good one for Erica, too, since 24-hour uh, urines are the bane of our patient's existence <laughs> on clinical trials. Uh, why do we still do them? Are they necessary? Well, well for, in terms of clinical trials, we do... Um, they are required at the start of each cycle, and I know I've sp spoken to a lot of patients, and it's really hard to get people to bring these things in, but it does give really valuable information about myeloma in your urine. So we do require them, and it's also important for uh, response assessment because we use both the bone marrow um, biopsy results, the blood results, and the 24-hour urine in, in conjunction with each other to d define what the results are on the clinical trial. So, and how about at the time of initial diagnosis? Is it needed to 24-hour urine? No. Uh, anybody? I think it, it is an odious test, but I think there's a good argument um, to do one as part of the initial workup because... Uh, you want to know if the amount of protein that's showing up in the urine correlates with what's being seen in the blood. And it gives you an opportunity to actually measure 
kidney function, which is a very important part of the initial evaluation of myeloma patients. So just from a technical standpoint, the kidney function that's on your blood test every month is actually estimated. It's not calculated. Whereas if you actually measure certain metabolites in the urine, you can calculate uh, accurately kidney function. I'll just add one part to that, too, and, and that is so uh, you're unlikely to develop any kidney insufficiency or kidney failure or kidney problems if you're not spilling the protein in the urine. So you might have light chains of 2,000 in the blood, but if you don't really have much in the urine, that's, great. that's actually a great sign that you, you're not going to be a person that has a lot of problems with uh, renal insufficiency from those light chains. So I, I do like to do it at, at the beginning, too. Um, and this may not be applicable to this group because many of you already have the diagnosis, but uh, there was a Mayo paper that looked at <coughs> the utility of the urine, and they found that when you do the serum protein electrophoresis, immunofixation, and free light chain, the sensitivity of picking up a plasma cell disorder was 99%. So, um, so if you're, somebody's being screened for myeloma or plasma cell disorder, they may not need to do the 24-hour urine. But I think we all agree, particularly with anybody where there's a concern for amyloid or any kind of renal dysfunction, it is mandatory to not miss what's going on in the urine. Um, we talked, moving to transplants, um, this came up on both of your talks, the role of a second transplant. When should you consider a second transplant? What are the pros and cons? So, so I, would, um, I would surmise it relatively quickly in that there is, um, in, in my practice, there's almost no role for a second transplant until, all, until somebody's essentially pentarefractory, I have no clinical trials, or they're refractory and their blood counts are too low to get on a clinical trial. So they have a ANC or a neutrophil count that's too low or platelets that are too low, and I have all these stem cells sitting in the bank that I think can boost back up their bone marrow. So in that course, I do a second transplant and then give them back their stem cells with the hope is that they're going to grow their platelets back up to more than 100,000 and their ANC good so they can go on to get a clinical trial. But, um, you know, the, I would have to say that the, the, the medicines that we have coming down the pipe in the clinical trials, these ADCs, these dual targeted antibodies, the CAR Ts, et cetera, they are so exciting that I think they're going to be. Um, it's much better to go on one of those trials than to get a second transplant, my own opinion. So the only thing I'll add to that is that uh, for people who are uh, investigating immunologic therapies in myeloma, a second transplant is actually an area of great interest because you do get that loss of, uh, you get, do get the reduction in the tumor and what's so-called immunogenic cell death. So it's, a, it's an opportunity uh, to apply immunotherapy uh, mechanisms to try to uh, induce remission. So we're doing a lot of research in that area, and if those trials are available to you, I'd encourage you to explore them. But I agree, there's so many good options now for relapse therapy that uh, the second transplant's down the list now. Two other points I would make are, um, I think one use of second transplant that's really um, helpful is in a way, we, the, the outcome of the first transplant is your biological test of sensitivity to melphalan. So the typical, as you heard, is two years with maintenance survival, it's four-year remission. And that's, but the thing is, median is that's the middle of the bell curve. And so there's two sides to every bell curve. And we've had patients with dramatic transplant remissions after the first transplant. Some of our patients has, were following us around from St. Vincent's, which closed in 2010. And so when you have a really long remission after the first transplant, that's an indicator that that patient's myeloma is exquisitely sensitive to my, the melphalan chemo, and that patient may benefit from a second transplant um, to get another. Because statistics have shown that a second transplant's remission are only about 50 to 70 percent of the duration of the first one. So if your first remission's short, why go through the whole hassle of another short remission? But if it's a really long remission, even that 50 to 75 percent is still going to be a large chunk of time and it's important to note that in this era, in 2017, even though there's many cost constraints globally, everywhere you go, transplant globally is still done for myeloma because it is cost effective. It's a one-time intervention, and it's associated with a long remission. So even in resource-poor countries, transplant is still being done. And then the other point that um, Tom brought up, too, is in the relapse setting, we just published that patients who were heavily, heavily treated, we used it as a salvage transplant 
to get people to clinical trial. It was quite effective. 75% um, of patients who had low blood counts that prevented them from getting onto a study were able to resuscitate their marrows such that they could go onto a study. And we've also done it in some settings where um, we just are doing this with a patient right now who, who has clinical trial opportunities, but the myeloma is exploding at such a fast rate that by the time we would do the screening test, the marrow, and roll, that time period is, is too long for that patient. And so sometimes we'll do that transplant, not because we're expecting a very durable remission, but we really just want to smack that myeloma down, and then the minute it squeaks up, jump onto the study, so that you give that study a meaningful chance. Because if you're going into a study with explosive disease, and if it's an immunologic <coughs> agent particularly that needs time to kick in, you're not even going to be able to get that benefit because the disease is exploding too quickly. So I think that is another role for transplant, is that kind of bridging to another treatment. Um, just to clarify, there was a clarification. The name of the medication um, was well called. Or it's a bile sequestrant. There was just clarification about the name. So then um, I guess there were some questions about drug switching, maybe for Tom's relapse discussion. DARA versus ELO, which monoclonal do you use? And also, if somebody's on a, this was a specific question, Velcade, Palm, Dex, can they switch to an all oral regimen? Um, so, yeah, so uh, I'll take the second one first because that's real easy. So if you're on Velcade Palm Dex and you want to switch out the Velcade for Ninlaro, yes, all the power to you, especially if the insurance will cover it. And I have people that are on Ninlaro Palm Dex and are doing really well, and it is all oral. Well, I have one guy that he boats around the, around the Mediterranean in the summer, and he got all his medicines delivered to him. He did fine. Um, the other one, the se sequence of these drugs has not been really worked out well. You know, which to start first, which to start second, et cetera. And that's even compounded by the antibody-based therapies. My general rule of thumb is if somebody is actually progressing um, um, slowly and has had a long remission duration, I tend to go with elotuzumab as the first antibody because it's, it's very well tolerated. It's only in an hour in infusion after the first infusion. And typically, we're going to have a really good response. I think daratumumab is a more potent antibody. Somebody that has a more aggressive relapse or a shorter remission duration, I almost always go to daratumumab first. Now, we don't have a lot of information on, well, what if they're refractory to ELO? Can they, you know, what's the response of going to dara? I can personally tell you that I've had people on ELO and I've given them dara and they've had responses. The vice versa, though, I have not seen. So I have had patients on daratumumab and then went on to elotuzumab and did not have responses. So, you know, that, those data do not exist. Maybe these guys also have some clinical experience. Um, I typically, just like anything else, I like to kind of ping pong the antibody-based therapy. Uh, it's almost like a ping o pong, and that is they get an antibody, I give them something else that's not antibody-based in case any of, the rela any of the refractoriness is based on mechanisms to prevent antibody you know, activity, and then I'll give them, go back to an antibody-based therapy. So that's my, that's, that's the California approach. Well, I think it's important to point out uh, that it's easy to think of antibodies as one class of therapies, but they're actually, there are actually many different classes of therapies. Uh, each antibody targets different things. So uh, elotuzumab targets SLAMF7. Uh, daratumumab targets CD38, and these are all different targets. They're not equivalent, and they'll have different effects, side effects, and they have different therapeutic effects. So one, uh, having been treated with one antibody does not necessarily mean you're not going to respond to another antibody. And uh, as Tom mentioned, he's had some clinical experience one way or the other. Um, but the bottom line is each antibody is uh, as different as the target that it's going after. So. Uh, if you've had an antibody-based therapy and you've progressed through that, that doesn't mean you can't get another antibody. It depends on what that antibody is going to target. So. so maybe in the last remaining uh, questions, we haven't talked much about the immune system and infections and so forth. So we'll start with Erica. When do you use IVIG? What are the indications in myeloma? Uh, so usually we give IVIG when um, you have hypogamma globulinemia, that means that your uninvolved um, immunoglobulins are low. It 
We also couple that with if you've had an infection requiring antibiotics for um, over three times in a year, then we would require IVIG, and this helps prevent infections um, from happening in the future. We give IVIG monthly. Uh, and can people be hypogammaglobulinemic or have a low IgG even if their myeloma is in remission? Yes. Yeah, so that's important. And then the, for the rest of the panel, what, what about um, somebody had concerns about the opportunistic infections with dexamethasone, um, the low lymphocyte count, the risk of shingles, how can patients minimize their infectious risk, and uh, especially in the winter time with this season? So, um, the multiple myeloma by itself is a disorder that affects your immune system, and then the drugs that we give you that target plasma cells don't only target the abnormal plasma cells; they knock down your normal plasma cells also, and that's why the IgG level like Erica was saying, is low, because even your normal plasma cells making normal antibodies are, are suppressed. Um, it's really hard. You know, we use, to see, we use prophylaxis medication, so you take acyclovir to prevent shingles. Um, when somebody goes on the true pulse dex, four days of dex, I often will put them on um, Levaquin or an antibiotic uh, to prevent pneumonia during that period of time. And if somebody's going to be on dexamethasone 20 milligrams or more for a prolonged period of time, I also give them an antibiotic pill, either Dapsone or Septra, to prevent pneumocystis, the, new, the pneumococcal pneumonia. Um, now, despite all that, if we look at all the clinical trials for myeloma, about 10 to 20 percent of the time for all clinical trials, there's a, or an incidence of 10 to 20 percent of pneumonia or shingles, et cetera. It happens, and there's not much we can do it. What you guys can do, you guys have to be a little bit neurotic, especially in flu season. You gotta have the Purell in the pocket. Every time you touch the door handle, you know, on the subway, or the, the holder thing on the subway and all this other stuff, you get the Purell out and do it. Because when you get the flu or something, it's gonna feel a lot worse than you than somebody else who gets, gets the flu, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. Uh, pro taking your prophylactic medications is very important. Um, and uh, if your physician recommends IVIG for prophylaxis, uh, definitely comply with it. <coughs> and um, report any symptoms that you have. You know, if you develop a fever, get flu swabbed. Within 24 hours of symptoms, you can get a. Uh, there's drugs. Uh, there's a drug called Tamiflu that could help shorten the duration of the symptoms. So definitely be proactive. Fevers, any uh, significant um, like prolonged diarrhea with abdominal pain, any symptoms that are unusual, you should definitely bring to the uh, attention of your physicians and do so promptly because something can be done about it in most cases. Just a quick follow-up. How long should IVIG be continued once initiated? So we usually do it until there's recovery of normal immunoglobulins or uh, or if there's some sort of limiting toxicity. But in general, it's a, prolong it's a prolonged supportive care measure because a lot of times if patients are on continuous therapy, the immunoglobulins are going to be, the normal immunoglobulins are going to be low.